welcome to HRTC Sport. Right, well, that Leeds Villa game was an absolute piss take. What I took away from that second half was that Pontus Janssen is a Patrick Bamford's an absolute disgrace. And Conor Hurwin looks like he'd batter you if you beat him at Connect Four. It was a mental game. I mean, come on, you know things are weird. When the most honourable man on the pitch just happens to be the lad who sends fellas to spy in the fucking bushes. When my uncle did that, he got seven years in jail. It was honest, Scott, one of the weirdest things I've ever seen on a pitch. And I've seen Titus Bramble try to defend a fucking corner. There always seems to be something strange with Aston Villa these days. Whether it involves their greasy number 10, who I'd gladly chuck in a fucking bin, getting smacked in the head by some overweight plumber, or now half the Villa team trying to disembowel Matthijs Klitsch in front of the watching world. Honestly, it just looked like a scene out of The Walking Dead. Led by Huron, as the Villa players tried to tear him apart at the fucking seams, this was a massive game. Villa were the form team in the championship, and they finally got their defence in order and won 10 games in a row, no doubt prompting some Villa fans to have a nightly tug in the shower over our return to the goddamn Premier League. Leeds fans on the other hand were probably rocking back and forth, having lost two games in a row, chucked automatic promotion down the toilet and now look destined to spend another 15 years outside the top flight. Honestly, if those fans, some of which were visiting the San Siro not too long ago, have to spend another five years travelling to Rotherham and it's Gunthorpe. I wouldn't be surprised if they just give up on life itself. Although, to be fair, if you survive three years of Michael Brown in your team, you could survive anything. Anyway, it was a fiery game, very close, and then Jonathan Kodja goes down in a crumpled heap. Villa players expect Leeds to do the gentlemanly thing and, you know, kick the ball out of play. But you've got to remember, lads, Leeds United are the same club who 40 years ago would have probably two-footed a toddler if it meant they'd win the league. Like, yes, it's obviously a very different Leeds team to the days of Don Revy, but does the DNA ever really leave a club? And no, they played on. Klitsch picks the ball up, cuts inside a villa defence practically half asleep, and rifles home before Horan grabs him and all hell breaks loose. Look, Stuart Atwell is a ref who's had his fair share of controversy before. Like when he just pretended that Reading had scored a goal, despite the fact that the ball had gone nowhere near the f***ing net. But to be fair, I mean, he was right not to blow the whistle. It's it's not a foul. So really, it's, it's just up to the Leeds players to just find enough moral fibre to put the ball out. But no, they didn't, and then things just got ridiculous. Onwar Al Ghazi gets sent off for punching Patrick Bamford, except no, it's 10 years later and Mr. Atwell he's still pretending he saw things that never f***ing happened. El Ghazi didn't touch Bamford. Instead, the former violinist hits the deck, clawing at his face as if he'd just been blinded by a f***ing screwdriver. This is the same man who might be getting a call-up for Ireland, despite the fact he sounds posher than the f***ing queen, and wants to wait until the end of the season before committing. I.e. desperately hoping that Leeds get promoted to the top flight, so Gareth Southgate might remember that f***ing exists. Lads, you can f can keep him. The lad is a disgrace. Where does El Ghazi touch you? Christ above, I know you have all the upper body strength of a box of shreddies, but he didn't f***ing touch you. Which is something that Tito Jackson has been saying for the last 10 years. Anyway, fair play to Marcelo Bielsa, basically screaming at his players to let Villa walk down the pitch and score a goal to level things up. So Villa, cheered on by a stadium of booze, stroll down the pitch unopposed to score. Well, I, I say unopposed. Pontus Jansen looks like the type of fellow who'd rather die than willingly let his team score a goal. For him, this was just too alien and bizarre a concept. Concept. Like buying a house in Sutherland or marrying your f***ing cousin. To be fair though, I do think Atwell should have taken more control. It shouldn't be up to the players to ref themselves. The onus shouldn't be on them to kick the ball out. When you bring an expectation of morals and human decency to a sport bankrolled by billionaires with literally millions of pounds at stake, do you really think every player is going to be on the, on the same page? Like this isn't the local kick around down the local park. Like what if this was a fight for an actual title? The Leeds players want to win some silverware and desperately haul themselves out of this godforsaken division? Or you know, do they want to get their hands on the f fair play award? Like egos, livelihoods, competitive nature, all these things are tumbling through the minds of the players. Of course it's going to turn into a goddamn mess if they're left to their own devices. John Terry spent about 10 minutes looking as if he was going to explode with pure, unadulterated indignation and rage on the sidelines. Yeah, do you really think he'd be kicking the ball out if he was on the pitch? So I, I don't think you're exactly a bastion of morality, lad. Anyway, congrats to North City and Sheffield United on promotion. I'll touch any more in my upcoming video where I look back on the championship predictions I did at the start of the season. Good Christ, it makes for ugly reading. So Virgil van Dijk is one of the PFA player of the year. That man has done brilliantly in Liverpool. And he's one of the best defenders in the world. 75 million pounds was an absolute snip. And I'm so happy that I was one of the first ones to actually predict that he would do so well. Virgil van Dijk for 75 million pounds. Yeah, they lost Coutinho to Barcelona, a transfer that Stevie Wonder could have telegraphed, but chucking away half that fee on van Dijk? Did they learn nothing from spending half the Torres money on Andy Carroll? Yeah, comparing Van Dyke to Andy Carroll. It's like comparing a Lamborghini to a 
shoe box that smells of death. Is he worth being the most expensive defender of all time? In the top 10 most expensive players ever? Worth more than Suarez, De Bruyne, even Kyle Walker. It's like me walking into a shop and paying a tenner for a pack of the crisps. Next summer, Maya Yoshida to Liverpool for 30 million pounds. Ah, oh, jeez, Chris, that's why do you listen to me at all? The young player of the award was picked up by Raheem Sterling. Yes, he's had a great season, but the lad, he's 24 years old. He's been playing in the Premier League for the last seven f***ing years. He has nearly 50 caps for England. He's played over 200 Premier League games, and he's appeared at two World Cups. Like, how is he qualified as young? He's 24. For Christ's sake, the man is practically middle-aged. Do you really think he classifies as young? Like, if you sent him over to the Netherlands ranch, MJ would have probably sulked in his room for a f***ing week. Anyway, remember this. Let's start with PSG. Jesus Christ, you absolute bottle jobs. How do you fuck up that badly? For all the money they spend, they have the mental fortitude of a dead badger. They are the biggest bottle jobs in Europe. I'm sorry, but they just are. You will not find a more spineless bunch of footballers than PSG. And you might think that's harsh, but um... It's true. Yeah, uh, they've done it again. After losing two games to the league, including 1-5-1 to Lille, they conspired to lose the Coupe de France final on penalties to Rennes. The same club whose best player was relegated to the role of garbage man at PSG, Neymar wasn't too happy after this game. See? Apparently, some fan was insulting the PSG team and Neymar's performance. So the Brazilian allegedly gave him a bloody lip for this. I mean, but to be fair, I'd say the fan is secretly delighted to have been graced by the fists of a 200 million pound superstar. I mean, like, you know how it is these days. I wouldn't be surprised if that fella cuts off a chunk of his own bloody lip and sells it on f***ing eBay. For the legions of weird Neymar fans that spend their lives buying sweats of his jar on f***ing Gumtree. I mean, those people are out there. Like, you know who you are. So very quickly, let's take a look at what happened in the Premier League this weekend. Tottenham lost at home to West Ham. To be expected, considering much like this guy, they have one eye on something else entirely. Mikel Antonio lashed home for five yards before gyrating like a sexual deviant, turning Tottenham's new stadium into some low-budget strip club out the back arse of Burnley. Southampton drew 3-3 with Bournemouth, securing their safety, with Shane Long scoring his fourth goal in five games. Shane Long, the man who usually goes about half a year without so much as a shot on target. Scoring four goals in a month is just all the proof I need that the world is going to end. What Watford play Wolves in a rerun of that FA Cup semi-final. This time Wolves actually managed to hang on, with Diego Jota bagging the winner in the 77th minute. I'm guessing the home crowd weren't too bothered though, and just spent the day singing about that trip to Wembley they got coming up. Cardiff City travelled already relegated Fulham in a must-win game. Uh, it didn't go well. Ryan Babel smacking home from 30 yards into the top corner to give the Cottagers their third consecutive clean sheet and win. If I was a Fulham fan, I wouldn't be happy about this. I would be f***ing raging. Clearly this Fulham defence isn't as bad as we originally thought, but they're massive bottle jobs. The season's already done nice, you're, you're already relegated. Why have you only started playing in April? It's a bit like spending the first hour of an exam asleep on your desk before only waking up to sign your f***ing name. But Cardiff are pretty much down. After Brighton scored their first goal in about 10 years, grabbing a one all draw at Newcastle. Honestly, the fans must have forgotten what a goddamn goal looked like. Liverpool and Man City kept up their winning streak. The Reds smashed Huddersfield 5-0, which is a bit like punching a four-year-old in the f***ing face. While City beat Burnley with a Sergio Aguero strike, that crossed the line by a goddamn centimetre. And just finally, the battle for top four is absolutely laughable. Honestly, they should just shave off that final Champions League spot and just give it to someone else. Because honestly, nobody from Man United, Chelsea or Arsenal is deserving of getting into the Champions League for next season. No one is taking advantage. It's just a bit like a race between three old women fighting over the last crumble pie in Tesco's. Arsenal got smashed 3-0 at Leicester, making that three defeats and nine goals conceded in a row. Man United and Chelsea, two former heavyweights that used to spar not only at the top of the league, but in Champions League finals, played out the most spineless drab game of football. It was a match made for Spaniards, with one matter giving the host the lead against his former club, before Marcus Alonso took advantage of a David De Gea error to level it up. I mean, I say David De Gea, he's playing more like Paddy Kenny after six points of brandy. Anyway, that's the end of the video, guys. It was just a quick wrap up of the weekend. If you have enjoyed, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, I'll talk to you in a while. Oh yeah, and whoever that young fellow pulled off a f***ing rainbow flick against me in 7 aside, you are an absolute bollocks. Their team name was, um, AC Me Rolling, and we got absolutely battered. I mean, I nearly scored a hat-trick, but we still got battered. Thanks to my defence playing like a bunch of f***ing geriatrics.